Hello, David Deger Hernandez here, and you are watching Spirit Church on the Encounter TV Network. There are few things in life that are more precious than the anointing of the Holy Spirit. God has entrusted His power to you. So I want to talk to you about how to stir that anointing, how to keep that anointing, how to guard that anointing, and how to intensify the power of the Holy Spirit on your life. We're going to get right into that message right now, but first, Stephen Moctezuma is here with me. He's going to lead you in some very anointed worship, and then we're getting right into this message. Here is Stephen Moctezuma. All heaven declare the glory of the risen Lord. Who can compare with the beauty of So as I said, there are few things in life more precious than the anointing of the Holy Spirit. God has entrusted His power to you. Now think about what He's given you. He's given you the ability to drive out demonic beings. He's given you the ability to heal the sick. He's given you the ability to bring healing in the soul. And this anointing, this power that has been entrusted to you and I, intensifies. It weakens and it intensifies depending upon how we respond, how we live, and how we hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. Now, I want to make this very clear. All of us have an anointing from the Holy Spirit. All of us have the presence of the Holy Spirit if we are born again. So I'm not talking about receiving it or obtaining anything. I don't believe at all that you can receive any more of the power than that power that God has given to you. In other words, all the power that God has has already been deposited into every single believer. So the question is not, can I have more of the power of God? The question is, am I surrendering in a way that allows that power to intensify on my life? So this anointing is priceless and it can intensify. It can increase on you even though it is constantly present in you. So there is this thing in the world this idea, this demonic doctrine that I refer to as moral relativism or hedonism, and that's a common term for it. And I think that's a good term because the world has this system of belief that basically says, whatever you believe, you believe, and that can be true for you. 
whatever I believe, I believe, and that can be true for me. It's called moral relativism. And the funny thing about this is it's summarized in this really interesting way they phrase it, which is to each his own. And what's funny about that is to each his own only works if each doesn't actually believe his own. Not everyone can be right, but everybody can be wrong. We as believers know that we have the truth. Now, why am I talking to you about this? That's because I want to compare this belief, this worldly doctrine, moral relativism or hedonism or do whatever pleases you philosophy. I want to compare that to a philosophy that has actually crept into the church. And this philosophy actually is minimizing, decreasing the potency of the power of God on his people because they've accepted this in their lives. So the world has moral relativism and they encapsulate that belief in the phrase to each his own. But the church has its own form of moral relativism. The church has its own form of to each his own. Now we don't say to each his own. Instead, the church says, well, I'm not convicted about it. Or that's not something that I believe personally I need to do. Here's my question to you. Since when are your convictions the standard of the Spirit? It's always been about the standard of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit's convictions are the ones that we are to follow. So, if we want to see an increase in the power of the Holy Spirit, we want to see an increase of that intensity on our lives, again, not obtain it, we already have it, but see an increase of the manifestation on our lives, then we have to go by the Holy Spirit's standards and not our own. The power of God upon you is directly related to the purity within you. I'm going to say that again. The power of God upon you is directly related to the purity within you. Whenever you are confronted with temptation, I want you to ask yourself this question. Is this sin worth the anointing on my life? Is this act of temporary pleasure worth the anointing on my life? Is this action worth the ability to cast out devils? Is this action worth the ability to raise the sick out of their sickness? Is this action worth the ability to break the yoke of bondage in people's lives? You've been given the power of God to break off bondages, to set people free from addictions, to deliver unto them the truth that will liberate their souls. So you have to ask yourself whenever you're confronted with temptation, is this something that is worth the anointing on my life? We have to value the anointing because there's nothing like it. There is nothing like the power of God. So how do you stir it? I'm going to show you. There are three things you have to look out for that you have to really, in all honesty, completely stay away from if you want to see an increase. Now, the first is very obvious. Psalm chapter 97, verse 10 says, Let those who love the Lord hate evil, for he guards the lives of his faithful ones and delivers them from the hand of the wicked. Look at what it says here. Let those who love the Lord hate evil. The demonic in or around you, that which is sinful, that which is evil, that which is hellish, that which is demonic, in or around you, can diminish the power of the Holy Spirit upon you. Now, I remember I was ministering in the Midwest and I was praying before the service and I could sense a warfare in the atmosphere. So I step out onto the platform and I'm just about to preach and I'm getting ready to minister when all of a sudden I sense in the back of the room this really dark spirit hovering. And I knew it was demonic because, as I said, I sensed the warfare in the atmosphere beforehand. And the people's worship was being inhibited. It was was not as free as it should have been. And so I take a look and I notice, as I sense this pool toward the corner of the back of the room, I look behind and I, I, I look behind the people and I notice this man wearing all black, with metal piercings all throughout his body. He had this sinister smile on his face and he's holding a satanic Bible. Before I saw him in the room, I felt him in the room. And so I look and I saw this man's presence brought with him demonic presence. And that demonic presence was affecting the worship of those who were weak in the spirit or who were not aware of spiritual warfare, who were probably compromising in some areas of their lives. 
And so as soon as I recognized that, I got up on the platform and I told the people to pray. In fact, I pointed them out. I said, there's a Satanist here and I know his intentions are not good. The people of God began to pray in tongues. His demeanor fell and the power of the Holy Spirit started flowing. It was instant. And as I always say, it wasn't a counseling session. It wasn't a long deliverance interview. It was as simple as praying and the power of the Holy Spirit moved. So what am I saying to you? I'm saying that the presence of the demonic can diminish the anointing in your life if you've opened a door to it. Now, if somebody comes in demonized and I'm in the power of the Holy Spirit, I'm walking in holiness, there's nothing on them that's going to affect anything in me. But if I've been compromising, if I have allowed that thing into my life, into my home, into my ministry, into my preaching, some preachers, believe it or not, allow demonic doctrines into their preaching. If I've opened that up, then I've opened that up for influence, demonic influence. And that demonic influence will weaken the anointing. It will it will cause it to be quenched when you want to stir it. So you want to stir up the anointing in your life. What you need to do is remove demonic imagery from your home, from your clothing. Remove demonic influence from any aspect of your life. And by demonic influence, I'm not just talking about things of the occult. I'm talking about sin. I'm talking about compromise. I'm talking about the things that we do that directly contradict the Word of God. We need to watch what we see. Some of those TV shows you watch, some of those movies you watch are filled with demonic imagery. And you're inviting that into your life. You need to watch what you say, your confession. You're, 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 you're actually allowing influence to be given over to the enemy when you speak things contrary to the Word of God. You need to be careful about what you hear, what you listen to. I'm not just talking about media like music and TV shows. I'm talking about the counsel of the ungodly. I'm talking about demonic influence that can come through manipulative people. You must be on your guard. If you want to stir that anointing on your life, then you have to be rid of the demonic. Now, you might say, but I'm not convicted about this or that. Doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. What matters is the conviction of the Holy Spirit. What are His convictions? What does He desire to be around? In what atmospheres does He desire to move? What makes Him most comfortable? So, get rid of the demonic in your life. Number two, we have to be aware of the secular. Now, the secular is interesting because it's a little more subtle. The demonic is very blatant. It's anything that contradicts the Word of God. But the secular is that which contradicts the nature of God. So it's not always going to be easy to spot. Few people know the Word. Even fewer people know God's nature. So the secular is something that's more subtle. It's something that's more hidden. But I want to show you something in Scripture in just a moment. First, I want to talk to you about how I first recognized this. On my way to minister to different church services or at different miracle services, even before taping TV programs, I would notice, and I noticed this early on, and I didn't understand it till later. A mentor of mine was the one who pointed it out to me, and it all became crystal clear. But on my way to services, or on my way to do a TV show, or on my way to minister to someone, I would often recognize that if I looked at a certain billboard on my way, even, even if it wasn't something that was directly demonic in nature, or directly sinful in nature, there, was, there were just certain images that would weaken that, that sense of God's power. If I would go into a place, think about this, and this, this, this will actually interest you here, and, and hopefully this will challenge many of you. I remember when I used to do youth conferences, I would go into these youth conferences, they would say, Brother David, we want you to preach and pray and bring the power of the Holy Spirit. So I would pray, I would listen to worship music, and then I would get into their service, and they would be playing secular music right there on the platform. They would do all these games. They'd say, okay, we're going to have games first. I'm thinking, what do games have to do with the presence of the Holy Spirit? And I would notice that even though some of the things they were playing weren't directly sinful, some of the things that were, they, were, they were doing and some of the things that they were showing and some of the things that they were entertaining on that platform, even though they were not directly demonic, I could sense sitting in my seat, the anointing and the power of God just diminishing. And there was no atmosphere prepared for the Holy Spirit whatsoever. The music they listened to, the games that they were playing were just silly, nonsense, waste of time. Um, I'm not saying there's never a time for that, but if you're pursuing a move of the Holy Spirit, you don't set it up by having people do strange things. And it, it just, it just the atmosphere just was not right. Look, as I said, um, these are things that not a lot of people think about. And you may not like me for this. You may not like that I'm saying this. You may think I'm being too religious. I'm not saying anyone's going to go to hell because they do those things. I'm simply saying, look at my life. 
if, if you want that, if you want that demonstration of power on yours, I'm simply telling you what I do, kind of like diet or exercise, you know, you don't really want to force that on people, but you say, hey, if you want these results, here's what you have to do. And I'm telling you from experience, those things weaken the anointing. You don't set an atmosphere for the Holy Spirit by having people play games. And I, again, I have nothing uh, in particular against games in and of themselves. I'm just saying preparing an atmosphere, you have to make sure you're not entertaining the secular. My mentor would often uh, tell me these things, and, and it wasn't until I, I learned this specifically from him. I had always known it somewhere in my subconscious, and I always recognized it, but it wasn't until he put words to it that I recognized, oh my goodness, that's right. You entertain the secular. You have to look at what you're watching, not just demonic, just things that are just distracting in nature, things that are just a waste of time. You have to be careful about that. Look at Matthew chapter 9, verse 23. The scripture says, When Jesus entered the synagogue leader's house, and saw the noisy crowd and people playing pipes, he said, go away, the girl is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took the girl by the hand and she got up. News of this spread through all that region. Now in that small portion of scripture there, it's talking about the synagogue leader's daughter who passed away. Jesus goes into the home, says she is just sleeping, everybody laughs at him. There was nothing necessarily demonic about that. There was nothing necessarily overtly sinful about that. These were just people who thought he was silly. They thought, how can he say that? This girl is obviously dead. And to be honest, if you were there, you might have done the same, especially because most people didn't know who Jesus was at the time. But we see here that it was just this attitude, this apathetic flippant attitude toward the things of God. They just didn't care. It wasn't a big deal. And it's that apathy that really is the essence of the nature of the secular. That apathy toward the things of God. There's a lack of reverence. There's a lack of solidarity. There's a lack of trembling before the presence of God. They don't prepare their hearts. They're just, they just live in this constant state of um, you know, easygoing demeanor, and they never experience the fullness of God's power because they don't know how to tremble before His presence. They don't know how to reverence Him. And that's because the secular has made them apathetic toward the sacred. So we have the sensational in our world, the entertaining, but we don't want the entertaining. We want the sacred. We don't want the vibrant and the exciting. We want specifically the holy presence of God. And I'm not saying that that's not exciting. I'm saying we don't seek excitement for itself. So my point here is simply that we have to watch for those things that are not necessarily specifically demonic or sinful, but are in and of themselves distracting and irreverent and apathetic toward the things of God. I can recall one time I was prophesying in a church service and I had never before seen so clearly prophetically. I'm telling you, in the service I was hearing people's thoughts. Now, you may think I'm crazy for saying that, but I'm telling you, I was hearing their thoughts. I don't claim that I can do that all the time. It was just the flow of the Spirit at that moment. And I was prophesying with specifics. Then all of a sudden, in the middle of the service, while this flow is going, this girl gets up and she decides to come back into the service she had left earlier. And instead of just sitting toward the back and being reverent, she decides to get up, walk all the way down the aisle, come all the way in, chat with a couple people in the front row, and then sit down right in front of me. And literally, I looked at her. I watched her come down the aisle. I saw her sit down. And I looked at the people. I said, well, that's it. I'm done. And I didn't imply that it was her. I don't think anybody caught that. But in the moment, I just realized that's it. That she, she, she totally, something broke. All I can tell you is something broke when she came in and distracted me and everybody else. And it was just that irreverence toward the things of God that completely broke the power of the Holy Spirit. So, number one, watch out for the demonic. Number two, watch out for the secular. That is much more subtle. And number three, it's a simple one. Watch out for the vain. You know, one time I had ministered at a miracle service and this woman got healed. It was a powerful time of ministry. This woman gets healed. She comes up to me after the service. She's so excited. I don't even remember specifically what she was healed from, but she comes up to me. And she says, David Hernandez, thank you so much for praying for me. I was suffering with this sickness for such and such time. And she goes on with her testimony. And then she says, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I said, oh, well, God bless you. And she left. And the moment she left, the Holy Spirit convicted me. He said, why did you receive her thanks? You see, she said thank you to me. And I didn't immediately point it back to God. Now, I wasn't trying to take God's glory. 
It wasn't my intention. In my mind, I wasn't going, yes, that's right. Thank me. I'm the one who did it. No, I know I'm not the healer. But God is so protective of his glory that the Holy Spirit convicted me and said, you go find that lady right now and you make it clear to her that I'm the one to thank, not you. So I left the line of people waiting to talk and I went to go find that lady. I said, hey, I just have to tell you this real quick. You thanked me. I just want you to know I'm not the one to thank. She said, yeah, I know. And just casually went on. I thought that was odd. Why is it that the Lord seemingly made such a big deal out of it. And that's because it was a big deal. That's how it starts. The scripture says in Isaiah chapter 42, verse 8, My name is the Lord. I won't let idols or humans share my glory and praise. All the men and women of God that I know who are being greatly used are very difficult to compliment. You try to tell them how much you appreciate them. You try to tell them how much their ministry has impacted your life. And they just kind of sidestep your compliments and they, they don't receive it. The compliments don't stick to them. It's very difficult to compliment a true servant of God because they're constantly shifting the glory right back over. They deflect it off of themselves and reflect it onto the Father. So the, the, the vein is what will kill the anointing in life. Receiving the glory, wanting to be admired, competing with fellow ministers, this ambition to be important, this ambition to want to sit in the front, this ambition to say, I want to take pictures with all the famous preachers, this ambition to be recognized publicly. All of that will weaken the anointing on your life. Why? Because God doesn't want to share His glory. Well, that is it for the lesson. I want to pray with you now. I want to pray that God would keep stirring the anointing on your life and that you would put these things into practice and that you would guard that precious power that God has deposited in you. So Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for that one receiving this prayer now. And I ask you, Lord, to be their constant reminder. Holy Spirit, speak to them. Help them to walk in purity and safety. Protect their call as they cherish the anointing that you've placed on them. Remind us, Lord, of just what it is that we have received. In the name of Jesus, we pray. I want you to say it because you agree. Say, Amen. I want to welcome now the new members of Spirit Church. There you are up on the screen. We love you and we are praying for you. I always say that because I always mean it. If you would like information on how you can join the Spirit family, then go to davidhernandezministries.com slash spiritchurch. Go and sign up. It's absolutely free. When you sign up, you're going to get an email from our ministry every single week. And in that email, you're going to get a free teaching, brand new, fresh every single week, and a worship cover from my brother Stephen. And the best part, you can reply to that email for prayer support from our ministry staff Again, join the Spirit family, now over 8,000 members strong, from all over the world, actually. Okay, I want to get to your comments now, and these comments are from my message, My Encounter with the Demon. Now, these comments I like to read because it's how we can interact with one another. But if you would potentially like me to read your comments on this message next week, then go ahead and leave a comment in the comment section right now, and we may feature it in the next comment uh, segment on Spirit Church. So again, these are from the video, My Encounter with the Demon. You really should go watch that. In that video, I give you a truth that you absolutely must learn about demonic beings if you're going to be protected from their attacks. The first commenter writes, Dear Pastor, I am from India and your messages helped me so much in growing my spiritual life. Thank you so much. May God bless you, your family, and your ministry. Sarah W. writes, David, I am eternally grateful for your ministry and that God is moving through you to touch the nations in the name of Jesus. Well, thank you, Sarah. All glory belongs to Jesus, and we're so glad that lives are being touched all around the world. The next commenter writes, the nation is really blessed to have you teach more about the Holy Spirit. May God bless you. Keep on doing the good works of God. You know, the Holy Spirit really is one of our main focuses because God gave me a mandate. That mandate was simple. He said, I want you to introduce my Holy Spirit to your generation. And I pray that you are truly coming into fellowship with the Holy Spirit. The final comment comes from Diana M. who writes, This past week or so of discovering your ministry has radically changed my relationship with the Holy Spirit. I'm so turned to change how I see and understand God's work. So much is changing and now I can't get enough 
of any part of God. Thank you. You are all changing lives more than you will ever realize. May our Father in heaven bless you all. Well, that is just a wonderful comment. Again, all glory belongs to God. Her relationship with the Holy Spirit has been radically changed. Think about that. Now, here's what I need from you. Look, don't turn this video off. I want to talk to you. I'm not talking to someone else. I'm not talking to another viewer. I'm talking to you. Our ministry is expanding. Look, I've been saying this for the past couple of years because the past couple of years, month over month, we've just seen grow, growing, 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 growing. And I, I'm so excited to see what God is doing. Look at our events. Go look at pictures that we've posted on Instagram. Go look at things that we've posted on YouTube. Look at the, the crowds of people that are now coming. They're increasing. It's growing rapidly. Go look at the, the different things that we're doing through media. Look at some of the reach that some of the videos are getting. They're reaching hundreds of thousands of people at a time. This all comes together to create a reach of three to four million people almost every single month who are receiving the power of God. Look, now more than ever, the world needs the power of the Holy Spirit. Now more than ever. And I'm asking you, as our ministry is expanding now, look, we're, we're just a few weeks now away. I gave you that original date for when we're finishing the studio, and we're still on track for that. We're just a few weeks now from finishing that up. And it's going to be an expansion for our ministry such as we've never seen before. We are going to reach more people than ever before. We're already planning 2020, and our events are filling up almost every single month. We need your help. This ministry, it's, it's time to expand again. There are growing pains. And so we want to keep all of the content free. We want to keep all of our events free. You know, our ministry doesn't charge for event registration, even though we pay tens of thousands of dollars for events. We don't charge for media, even though monthly it costs thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. We do this because freely we receive, now freely give, and we go by faith. We go by faith that God's people will hear God's voice and respond. I'm asking you to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. I'm asking you to invest in this ministry and partner with me. Maybe you're someone who's watching. You want to have a ministry of your own one day, or maybe you do, and you want to see growth. Here's how you do it. You partner with a ministry that's experiencing fruitfulness because it's good soil. Maybe you're a business owner. You want to see God expand your business, whether it's large or small. Here's how you do it. You partner with the gospel. You take care of God's house. He'll take care of yours. So, I'm asking you now, partner with me, $10, $30, $100 a month. When you sign up to become my partner for $30 or more a month, I will either send you Carriers of the Glory, Encountering the Holy Spirit in Every Book of the Bible, or 25 Truths About Demons and Spiritual Warfare. It'll be my initiation gift to you, my thank you for becoming my partner. Sign up today. Maybe you've been watching us for a few months, you've been receiving, you're praying about it, now is the time. We're expanding. We need you. Let's do this. We got a world to win. Partner with me through a monthly gift or make a one-time gift today and be generous. I'm going to ask you to do this. Do something. If you're doing a one-time gift, I want you to sow something into this ministry that you've never sown before. Whatever you're used to, I want you to go above and beyond that. Sow something here and now today that you never have done before. Stretch yourself in your giving. Stretch yourself in your generosity. Why? So that Jesus might be glorified and that souls might be saved. Bottom line, when people perish, it breaks the master's heart. When you partner with us to invest in souls, to win souls, you're telling Jesus, Jesus, I want to wipe the tears from your face because I want to bring joy to your heart. I want to see you rejoice when that sinner repents. Help us do it today. Help us wipe the tears off the master's face. Go to davidhernandezministries.com slash donate now. Give a one-time gift or become a monthly supporter. Well, that is it for this edition of Spirit Church on the Encounter TV network. Until next time, remember, nothing is impossible with God. Thank you for watching Encounter TV. Don't forget to subscribe. Also, help me win souls by spreading the gospel through events and media. Make a one-time donation or become a monthly supporter by clicking on the donate link now.